you know, ain't Jim Hara here. And I'm just going to do a little sound check. Well, maybe not. Anyway, have a rather ambitious topic today where I hope to give a fair amount of information that will be helpful to people. Yeah, I think that's all good to go there. Okay, so, yeah, I've been looking into this well, looking into it more, but also uh, the more I work with clients and the more I see patterns and et cetera in deeper ways. Uh, yeah, so talk a little bit maybe about borderlines, projected blame, and, you know, what people at BPD do. But on this stream, I'm really going to, challenge people to think about your codependent self and what's really going on with that and why are you really blocked from no contact why do you keep feeling sorry for that person etc etc because it's all not in one's best interest it affect, it still stresses people out and it affects their mental health so codependency and the false self codependency and the reality of maybe not um, the kind of broken attachment of people with BPD, but most people with codependency do not get secure attachment in childhood as well. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about what is this stuff about the codependent false self? Well, you know, it, codependency starts in childhood, right? So children create a false self because they do not have enough emotional and social support to become emotionally and psychologically separate from their parents. This adapted self, this isn't the same as BPD, by the way, but like there's overlap of close similarity, but it's not the same. This adapted self can be either defeated, sorry, can be either deflated um, and codependent, or it could be inflated and counter-dependent. So you're going to talk a little bit about, maybe not much about, counter-dependency today as well. So the codependent deflated false self is designed to please a parent or the parents and maintain their, what is it? It's conditional love. It's not unconditional. It's not what people require to be healthier. The counter-dependent inflated is designed to protect children from feeling their unmet dependency needs by maintaining distance between themselves and the, and the parent or the parents. And so the true self, which operates from a sense of integrity, personal authenticity, and connection to wholeness, gets sacrificed in both adaptive processes. And this, I think, speaks directly to why people with codependency abandon and re-abandon and abandon themselves and self-sacrifice. So the deflated codependent false self is a protective defense that helps children sustain their need for comforting intimacy and it's um, attempts at attunement with mother and or this is like in really young in you know infancy and toddlerhood too. And to prolong the feelings of safety associated with the codependent stage of development, this codependent behavior also keeps people feeling weak and vulnerable with strong needs to attach to the others who seem stronger and more capable. And then just a little bit about the counterdependent false self. This inflated counterdependent false self helps children block feelings of shame about being loved conditionally because it's not good enough it's not enough it's not healthy enough as unconditional love or something a little bit better than conditional love and so it's also protection and blocks feelings from uh, falling into states of developmental shock and trauma related to experiences involving abandonment or anything that's abusive and this isn't the exact same for everybody who has codependency but a lot of people with codependency have had a cluster B parent. Those who use this defense of counterdependency typically act strong and capable, even though they don't feel that way inside. So it's a child's uh, adaptation to their parents' needs 
um, for them to adapt to lack of emotional availability, and it also forces them to abandon their inner urge to develop a separate true self. And then the result is, in codependency or counterdependency, that children grow into adults who grow up recreating these same kind of self-limiting codependent and counterdependent relationships in their adult lives. They continue to monitor and modulate the expression of their authentic ideas, feelings, and behaviors to make sure they do not threaten the conditional love from those closest to them. So I think that's something that, you know, I haven't talked about before on this channel anyway, but <clears throat> the false self component of people with codependency. So I'm going to get to um, the shame and the guilt. But, you know, first I wanted to say how toxic guilt and false, uh, uh, you know, and shame create this false responsibility that keeps people in codependent dysfunction. And in, you know, what, what are the trauma bonds with, well, people with BPD, but also narcissists. Um, so this is sometimes called a toxic or chronic guilt, which is closely related to a false and overwhelming sense of responsibility. Often children, um, if you can identify with this, people, children in childhood are parentified. And this is where this stems from more often than not. Or parentified at a time. Or parentified in a way and not maybe entirely. But this stems from the childhood environment and is carried into adulthood and adult relationships, whether they're romantic work or other types of relationships. So false responsibility, because this is what codependents have, is this idea of all this responsibility for this poor helpless person with BPD, learned helplessness, you know, lack of identity, can't really relate in any healthy way for a whole bunch of other deeper, even more traumatic reasons. And then, you know, you feel responsible. You know, so it's like in the little picture I have here, you know, a person with BPD, anger, rage, blame, and a codependent, toxic guilt, toxic shame. And between the blame and the denial, protective identification of the borderline, well, the codependent's kind of like going, well, I'm sorry. Like, it's just, it's just, it doesn't make any sense, but it, it's rooted in childhood. Because why should you feel sorry for what somebody did to you? Or blamed you for? So, you know, false responsibility, I don't know if I covered this already, but, um, refers to an attitude when you feel responsible for things that objectively you aren't responsible for. And, well, shouldn't feel responsible for. So, um, often it's in childhood at some point or other, people feel responsible for the needs and emotions of their parents or siblings or other family members or a parent. Usually the sense of responsibility comes from being overtly or covertly blamed and punished. Like, for example, you're making your mother sad, maybe a father would say to a child, or... A parent might say to a child, why are you hurting me when you're not, you know, or you didn't do what I told you to do and add some kind of blaming statement. Therefore, like now I have a migraine. Therefore, like, what am I supposed to do? You never listen to me. And, and a parent might even say, you don't love me. Of course, a BPD or NPD parent could do that. But parents um, and other authority figures often blame children for things that they themselves are fundamentally responsible for. So there you see, it, especially if you've had a cluster B parent, well, isn't that the age-old reality of BPD, NPD, and other mental health challenges wherein <clears throat> everything is everybody else's fault? So yes, you can have parents blaming children because they, they don't know how to take personal responsibility. Or they hold the child to an impossible standard and impossible expectations where the child is punished for making mistakes or being imperfect and blamed for failing. Meanwhile, you probably weren't even doing anything in a lot of these scenarios. It's all coming from often a cluster B parent, an emotionally un unavailable parent, 
a parent with some other kind of issues. Um, since, since children are powerless and dependent, they have no choice but to accept any treatment they receive from their caregivers. Since the children don't have a frame of reference, they also tend to normalize their environment or even perceive it as loving and caring, etc. So this false guilt, which is really toxic guilt, um, is instilled, you know, by, by what I've just said, you know, kind of parents or environment. Uh, guilt, shame, and anxiety, hurt, betrayal, disappointment, loneliness, emptiness, and so many other feelings. This false sense of guilt can even become a default state that is referred to as chronic or toxic guilt. And as a result, the person tends to take on unjust responsibility and feels overly guilty if things around them go wrong. They're quick to accept that everything is their fault, even though it isn't. And I just like to add to that the fact that a lot of people with codependency might think, no, I don't do that. I don't do it. But it can still be in your unconscious because it's within the wounded inner child. And this is what I do extensive work with clients on, by the way. So if I resonate with you, I'm out here to help you with all of this stuff that is tragic that it happens to people. Um, so... Yeah, children are really quick to accept that everything is their fault, even though, of course, it isn't. Um, and they also have a poor, they have poor boundaries if you can develop any at all, and end up emotionally enmeshed with parents, family of origin, other people, and try to manage other people's emotions or generally feel overwhelmed by other people's emotions. So not only can you be being blamed, but you can also have self-blame. Uh, so unlike people with strong narcissistic tendencies and similar dark personality traits who never take responsibility for their actions, people who suffer from false responsibility and toxic guilt within codependency are very quick to attribute what went wrong to themselves and blame themselves for it. So many children learn to blame themselves for being abused and mistreated or for not having your needs met, or a parent's not paying attention to you at times when that's crucial in early childhood. They're blamed for things. When children are blamed for things, they internalize it. Those are those injunctions and the in, in what's the word, sorry, um, invoked uh, things that become the internal critic. And so then children blame themselves for things from that point on or from whatever age or whatever thing, whatever happened in childhood. And then it happens so many times it becomes like a default mode. So when people with codependency grow up, it's only natural to, to continue um, this in their adult relationships, especially if they never took the time and effort to consciously and critically examine it. And then I just wanted to say a little bit about codependency and repetition compulsion because I've been talking about that here and there without going into it uh, a little more deeply but a lot of people who suffer from toxic guilt and shame that is what underpins really the development of codependency which refers specifically to dysfunctional relationships where one person supports or enables another person's unhealthy behavior which could be you know, like emotional challenges, mental health issues, or addiction, acting out, irresponsibility, abusive actions, and all kinds of other things. This is because a self-blaming person is used to, is used to, sorry, being in a dysfunctional relationship where they had to be responsible for the dis dysfunctional person's dysfunctional behavior. And so when you grow up, it all seems natural, even quote, normal, unquote, because it's simply that familiar. This unconscious drive to replicate one's dysfunctional childhood environment is referred to as a repetition compulsion, and it usually continues until the person becomes aware of it and is willing and able, you know, to get help and get into a healing recovery process to work that through. This also increases, by the way, uh, the susceptibility to manipulation and general dysfunction. So people who suffer from chronic self-blame constantly feel shame and guilt, which is toxic, by the way. Um, they're exceptionally susceptible to manipulation. 
The manipulator can always appeal to their false sense of responsibility or blame them for something or shame them to get what they want. So a lot of people with BPD don't know they're doing that. A lot of narcissists know they're doing that. And it's one reason why you find narcissism or dark personality traits often, you know, people with codependency involved in those type of relationships or with people with BPD. These relationship patterns are frequently talked about in tandem. And in a dysfunctional way, these two personality types or BPD codependency, NPD, and codependency fit together and draw each other like a sadistic and masochistic person attracts um, each other's company, like a person who likes to yell and control another person's life and someone who's used to being yelled at and controlled. I don't know if I want to say attract each other, but, you know, there is this compelling reason in the unconscious that really is part of how People get into these relationships when you have codependency. People replicate and act out their childhood dynamics in their adult relationships. Uh, some become more dependent and others might, you know, have BPD or, or be narcissists. So as children, many people are treated unfairly and cruelly. And sometimes people don't realize how they have been because it's not always to the nines of what that might mean. Many are routine, routinely blamed for things that are not, they are not responsible for or expected to meet certain unrealistic and unreasonable standards when you're just a child. And as a result, they learn numerous toxic lessons. So a few of those toxic lessons for many people with codependency, to blame themselves for being mistreated, to have unrealistic standards for yourself, to normalize and accept dysfunction, to unconsciously or even consciously seek dysfunctional relationships. I don't think too many people do it consciously, but false responsibility leads to false guilt and false guilt leads to self-blame. Over time, you internalize it. This makes you more susceptible to being manipulated and taken advantage of where you sacrifice your own well-being and self-interest to please and take care of and try to rescue and enable others. And this is basically a form of not only self-abandonment and self-sacrifice, it is self-erasure. It is like you don't feel, many people with codependence don't, unless until you get in healing and recovery, don't feel worthy enough to even really exist or be seen. That's deep down in the unconscious. And this doesn't have to continue forever. And then I just wanted to quote um, Beverly Engel, who said, quote, For too long we have been protecting the ones who have hurt us by minimizing our trauma and deprivation. It's time to stop protecting them and start to protect ourselves. We have been told and feel that we are responsible for their emotional well-being. We are not. We are responsible only for ourselves. And so to that, I would add the first step as always is recognizing this, but recognizing this in a deeper way, which is what I hope what I'm, the information I'm providing today will pro be providing more on. I think it's, I, I've, I've kind of strayed away from just putting it out there this way because I really feel for people and I, you know, and I've been through this myself. And so who wants to hear that maybe you're operating out of more of a false self than authenticity? But that's what I think a lot of clients that I work with discover, that there it's not anything that anybody does on purpose. So you can work on developing a more self-loving and self-caring relationship with yourself, and you can learn to have healthier boundaries, and you can learn not to accept unjust responsibility for others. Um, and all of this, by extension, will help you have healthy relationships and social interactions with others. Of course, the key thing there is the first build a healthy relationship to yourself and with within yourself and that's where the inner child healing family of origin work and self-differentiation is so crucial so just adding to this then um because you know it is it is the underpinnings of codependency or its alternate counterdependency really stem from shame a shame wound in childhood and also, um, this 
you know, false responsibility, this toxic guilt, because it's not healthy guilt. Healthy guilt is when you do something wrong and you feel remorse for it. But toxic guilt is like, it's not yours in the first place. It's hard to resolve and shame. Wow. That wound there is like, especially, well, anytime somebody gets a shame wound, but in childhood, what information you're really taking in, not always do people realize this, is not just that you're bad, that you did something bad, but that you are bad. So normally shame passes after an embarrassing incident, you know, for people that haven't had this childhood experience. But for people with codependency, shame is internalized from experiences in childhood, like I said. And it just sits there waiting be, to be activated and persists long after any event of its activation, like an open wound that is never healed. You're ashamed of who you are. It's all pervasive, paralyzes spontaneity, and to a degree defines people who have codependency. And guess what happens to you if you're with a BPD, let alone a narcissist? They're going to consistently push those buttons in you that are going to to um, recreate, activate this shame inside of you, this woundedness. So people with codependency, whether they know it or not, often don't believe that they matter or are worthy of love, respect, success, happiness, especially in relationships, maybe even in work, but you think that you're bad, defective, inadequate, a phony, a failure, or worse. And I've had so many clients, you know, express all of this to me as well. Chronic internalized shame makes ordinary shame feel more intense and last longer. And, and not that when you're with somebody with BP or a narcissist, you're getting normal shame. You're still being really toxically shamed. And so you can feel more, you know, you feel it more and it lasts longer and it creates shame, anxiety, largely about being acceptable to yourself and to other people. Extreme prolonged shame can lead to hopelessness and despair or cause a sort of psychic numbing, a feeling of like being um, really not alive inside or feeling like a zombie. And that, that is the toxic, um, codependency well well I, yeah i'm saying people are toxic but it's the toxic freeze response wherein people are just like frozen in this and maybe not aware of it maybe not feeling it internalized um shame causes such low self-esteem and most codependent symptoms such as pleasing um ad addiction caretaking control enabling depression lack of assertiveness intimacy issues and perfectionism, core feelings that stem from low self-esteem and internalized shame are almost endless, really. But unworthiness and fear of abandonment, where self-confidence would otherwise be, might feel unlovable and have rejection sensitivity where otherwise self-trust would be, have anxiety and a fear of making mistakes, um, where self-acceptance needs to be feel unimportant and fear criticism where self-responsibility needs to be, feel um, undeserving and, you know, often fear being a failure and or a success, you know, so there's no self-efficacy or self-agency there. And a lot of people with codependency, whether you know it or not, you know, everybody's not in the same place, but feel self-loathing and fear intimacy to, to varying degrees where self-respect should be. And then you can shame leads you to feel judgmental and fear your own power where self-worth and um, esteem should be and self-value. Internalized shame creates a chronic sense of inferiority. You may envy and compare yourself negatively to people whom you admire you may believe you're never enough, that you're not doing enough, attractive enough, smart enough, or good enough, because shame is painful, and especially toxic shame. You may be unconscious of your shame and think you have a good sense of self-esteem. 
And some people with codependency may boast or feel self-important, not like a narcissist, but and superior to those that maybe somebody is in a teaching capacity or supervising people, people of a different class or culture, or anyone that you judge. By devaluing others, you boost your, your yourself higher to deny and hide your shame from yourself. Most codependents fluctuate between feeling inferior and superior. And again, it's not the same for absolutely everybody, but toxic guilt and toxic shame are not the same as healthy guilt or healthy shame. And so that is... Um, what is the underpinnings of this loss of authenticity, loss of authentic self that creates so much difficulty and of course only gets multiplied in the repetition compulsion of the unhealthy relational codependent pattern of relating in not exactly the same way, but a similar way as what people with BPD are doing, but but people with codependency are going to err on the side of responsibility taking. And of course, people with BPD, you know, they don't know what that is. So anyway, I think that it was, you know, I know the first thing, it, well, I've known about this for quite a while, but I just never wanted to say, I was always, I was always like, it was codependent of me to go, well, should I just put it out there? But yeah, this idea that, you know, in codependency, another part of the healing process is really about finding your authentic self. So it's not just, you know, working toward boundaries and assertion skills and, you know, many other things that need to be healed and especially coming out of these relationships, but it's very much about not only loss of self in a relationship recently or maybe a little while ago or maybe it's happening to you right now, but that you have this, this is a carryover and a trigger to the original partial, not whole loss of self, in childhood for many people with codependency. Hey there, everybody. Um, and Keith said, do they want to run around like they are 18 again, like a kid and come back to safety net, a safety net, thinking you will always take them back like you're a mommy or a daddy? Well, I mean, you're asking a question about people with BPD, and I think, um, you know, they have those issues going on for sure. Um, I don't know that they think people with codependency are doormats, but what I've been just talking about is there's a tremendous woundedness to codependency that I don't think a lot of people realize, and that it's really important for people with codependency to stop focusing on the people with BPD and what their issues are because you're going to be in a world of hurt until you heal your own. I'm not saying that just to you, Keith. I'm just saying in general. Um, Alex, hello, AJ. Loving your live videos. Just popped up to say a quick hello. Can't wait to watch this tomorrow. It's getting late here in Serbia. Oh, yes. Well, hey. and Nice to see you. And you said uh, sending... Um, a uh, hug, uh, 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 sending a bug, I don't know, and a virtual hug um, to me and my other viewers. Well, thank you. Oh, Alpha Dog, thank you so much for that generous donation. Um, very kind of you. Um, Wheels, hi, AJ, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. How are you doing? Thanks for explaining repetition compulsions and codependency. Um, you said some of this sounds too familiar. Yeah, well, how are you doing, Billy the Goat? Nice to see you, because, like, I'm on earlier, aren't I? So it's, like, not, like, past midnight your time right now. So I think, I just wonder, you know, if people have any thoughts, feelings, or questions. Everybody isn't in the same place, right? But codependency and the loss of authentic self, and then that gets repeated when you're in a relationship with somebody with BPD or NPD or a psychopath or, you know, uh we talk mostly about cluster B, but it could happen, I suppose, in other relationship types too. So re really interesting that, you know, it's like all things related to trauma and varying degrees of trauma. The false self-protection is in there too. And it doesn't mean that I think that people with codependency are all like fake or acting. No, I don't believe that at all. But there is this 
false self that rises up to the constant sort of like pushing on people with codependency's triggers back to things that maybe they've forgotten from their childhood because depending how traumatic it was or was it more like uh you know a, not minor but a less traumatic experience so um it is difficult to say but i think a lot of people with codependency um don't really realize this part of the false self the toxic shame and the toxic guilt and what a block it is for many people not only in getting into a healing recovery journey but when you've left that bpx or they ghosted you or whatever the case and like but you just can't get to that full no contact and by the way no contact is many things and needed for many reasons but when you first say that first no and you're looking to heal and focus on yourself and heal yourself that that first no is as difficult as it is for all the reasons and i've spoken about some of them before and maybe will again that it's really important to know that you need to build momentum you know even even just changing your focus from the person with bp or the x or whomever or maybe it's still maybe it's still a narcissistic or borderline parent whether they're still alive or whether they passed away because when they pass away if people don't get their work in healing and recovery work done they're still going to be controlled by the internal critic that invoked narrative of a parent that was in some way injurious to you shamed you uh and and uh who who you couldn't get any unconditional love from or the proper attunement with um yeah hey there nancy so anyway um you know i i guess well yeah i guess i should come prepared to talk on forever until i'm done but you know if anybody has any questions you know that that would be cool or you know kind of like any of your own experience to share but i wonder how many people who are trying to get over relationships with a cluster b realize that it's not just that that you have to heal from and i wonder how many people with codependency have realized that there is this false self along with the toxic guilt and the toxic shame you know which which is like what i said earlier about how people in childhood and it doesn't have to be like the worst abuse in the world but for some kids it is too and then it's a more resilient temperament i think is the difference between people in some cases with say a narcissistic parent especially if you have a narcissistic mother and then you, you develop codependency as opposed to bpd well then then the difference between those two camps i see it's largely sensitive temperament in 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 the case of bpd and more resilient temperament in the case of people with with uh, codependency or sometimes it's one parent that there are issues with it can often be mother sometimes it's father but sometimes the other parent <clears throat> excuse me is a counterbalance or helpful to you know some kind of a better experience and a healthier experience and um sarah said do you think helps that the person with bpd gets away from the controlling parent um they never get away from the controlling parent much like codependents won't either until unless each does their own work so it uh, they they don't want to get away they're enmeshed um so yeah it can be highly conflictual it can be like world war whatever but um they rarely get away unless and until they get treatment and therapy and etc <clears throat> wheels um hmm. well yeah that's that's interesting that you came to that awareness because that sounds like some important important insight that you know there's um with your father there's a cycle of abuse even separate from that with uh your mother 
Billy the Goat, perhaps saying no to abusive partners is perceived as saying no to yourself. So to counter, in effect, you say yes to them and mesh dynamic. Well, that's interesting because um, at least in the beginning, right? Like a lot of people have healed in things. But in the beginning of, you know, like when you grow up and you're an adult and you get into a relationship and whether that first relationship is with a cluster B or not, I think um, that people with codependency often don't really know how to say no. Uh, that That's an issue too. Hi there, Mark. Um, yeah, I'm doing fine. How are you? Uh, Nancy, I've got a crazy experience with a guy with quiet BPD and CPTSD recently. It's a long story. I'll just type in um, chunks. Um, I've been binge watching your BPD videos this weekend because of it, AJ. I'm sorry to hear that happen, Nancy. And, um, yeah, and I think whenever people encounter, um, how can I put this? But when you encounter re-experiencing things like that, again, it's like people need to look at what, because people have done a lot of healing, right? And, I mean, nobody's perfect. But people can do really well with recovery from codependency. And then when you get around another, quote, toxic, unquote, person or cluster B, it can kind of slide back a little bit, you know, and that's all it kind of takes to go through, not maybe to the same degree as one has in the past, but another one of those experiences <clears throat> that is certainly not healthy for anybody. But I think that, you know, what a lot of the information I put out in the beginning here is really also for people to think about beyond everything else that that i'm often talking about in this channel i'm sure lots of other people are on youtube is really where some of the blocks come from the deeper and the more difficult blocks to get through to getting and going and staying no contact something that i don't know in the last few years and working with clients is uh and comments to the channel, I've been made more aware of that, you know, some people can get there in, in a more sort of like, not immediate, but quicker way. And some people just, you know, what's going on for the people that keep saying, but I feel sorry for them, but I, I keep thinking about them. And there's so many reasons for why you're thinking about them, but add to that, how much they represent for many people's codependency a parent in their childhood and all that woundedness. <clears throat> and Sarah said, uh, you can only slide back in your recovery if you start engaging in Hoover's and then want to contact. Yes, um, but to get to where people really need to go to turn the corner and move forward, there has to be no contact, firmly in place and not compromised. Because what's the number one thing people say about why they can't do that yet, or they haven't done it yet, or they're not ready to do it yet, is, well, I feel bad for them. Well, I feel sorry for them. Well, that's still an extension of something unhealed inside people's codependency that isn't just about an ex with BPD or, or, or an arc ex. It goes back to childhood still. So it's, um, and you know, like, People with codependency, uh, to varying degrees, and everybody's in their own different places with this, of course, will continue to stay in some modicum of the pattern that is deep within the unconscious of the person with codependency as well. What, what part of that pattern, what part of that trauma bond is because people have codependency they stay and they'll keep staying in that to externalize um, from having to face some of the deeper pain that healing from codependency really requires people to work through. And, you know, it's, it's like it's extremely difficult work. And I think codependency is something that the word can be thrown around so haphazardly. And yet it is very, a very, very painful relational style and pattern to have in one's life. <clears throat> uh, 
And Nancy said, I have a narc and psychopathic, you have narc and psychopathic exes, and I had a BPD friend, so I thought I knew how to avoid cluster Bs and psychopaths. I've been cluster B free for three years. And then he said, so I wonder why I fell for the BPD love bombing. It was the most intense, top-notch love bombing I've ever experienced. I feel stupid. I should have known better. Well, try not to judge yourself. And um, people with BPD aren't love bombing, but people continue to say that, so I'm sure it felt like that. But that mirroring, you know, along with that idealization, and um, I forget the other third part of that I always do. Well, they're codependency as well. They're they're people pleasing. But yeah, I mean, and maybe, you know, it's hard to say, but you see when, it, like you said, you were cluster B for three years, which is a great accomplishment. And then somebody comes along and for some reason you just don't see the red flags and they're all different, right? Some of them don't really wave the red flags at first. And then the next thing you know, it's like, again, it, it might have felt too good to be true, but, and I'm not saying, hey, that makes you, you're, you're all the way back to step number one with codependency, but it, it's, it's still, it's like, even when we do our best to heal it, it's like, we, we can do really well, but we can still be a little bit susceptible to when a toxic person is doing their dance, so to speak. And and it sounds like that's what happened to you. And I wouldn't um, be judging yourself about it, Nancy. It's like nobody's perfect. And um, you said, I'm also in a happy, healthy relationship. I've also done a lot of inner work. I worked on myself before reconnecting with my current partner. I don't know why I fell for this BPD dude. Yeah, well, that's interesting. And, and obviously something you'd probably like to figure out. And you said, yes, the mirroring and idealization big time. Yeah, and if only more people could know, but it's hard, right? That even in idealization, people with BPD aren't idealizing the person that they're you know, wanting to enmesh with and get identity through as much as they're idealizing from the get-go, you know, someone else's object, other parent representation of mother, father, or parent never had, or because, you know, it's usually what was never had, not that there was a great parent that they are um, then, you know, but even in idealization, you're not being as seen as it feels like you are, and that's just a real bummer of it all. You know, to want, the only way I could think to put it right now. But uh, interestingly enough, I just wonder if people realize, you know, that toxic shame and toxic guilt, even when you've done a lot of work and done really well, can still be, in part, you know, not fully healed. And um, Nancy said, he sex bombed me big time. I felt sorry for this guy because of the extreme trauma he went through. Ah, bingo, there's one button he pushed for sure. He was abused by narcissists and psychopaths, so we had that, uh, that common bond. Well, Nancy, yes, and I, I don't, um, I have compassion when I say this to you, but that was a red flag, right? And a red flag that anybody could miss. Um, that you had that common bond of both having been abused by narcissists and psychopaths. Well, you know, hey, it, it could have meant that you were going to meet a person with codependency, but, you know, it turned out that, no, they had BPD. So really sorry to hear that you went through that. But again, this speaks to the, the reality that there's no perfection in all of this, right? We can heal and we can do our best and we can get assertive and we can really change the dynamics of codependency from our lives, you know, and heal from that. But nothing is perfect in that regard. And I think that's been my experience in my life. Like, never mind the codependent issues I've had on a channel, which I'm trying to like, you know, definitely lose. Um, but the thing is, it, I know myself that I still tend to have this reaction of, a freeze or fawn response 
if somebody pops up in my life, not necessarily online or anything, and like when I say pops up in my life, not somebody in my life, but you know, like if you encounter somebody you don't really know, or you know, it's a friend of a friend, or it's just somebody who you hire to do a job for you or something, and they're and the next thing you know, they're being really toxic and stuff. Well, one thing I'm aware of that's happened to me not so much recently, but it's happened to me a couple of years ago. I immediately started to go back into a fawn or freeze response. And I usually catch myself and then I'm not happy about it. But then I still, it's like, it's like we heal so much, but toxic people will still push on the buttons and the buttons are pretty healed, right? Like you did a lot of work, Nancy, but like, and I'm not comparing what I'm talking about to what you said, because when it involves intimacy and physical intimacy, that's going to be even harder to, you know, not uh, back up in the middle of and sort of like, it's different. But I just think it's important people with codependency realize first of for, for mostly the healing journey. And then when people get far down that road in that healing journey, um, toxic people can still uh well i don't want to say drag it out of us but we can still encounter something there and i think that's what melody Beatty wrote about in her book codependent no more which i haven't read for like 20 years or something but she had a chapter on sort of what she called a bit of a relapse or something um or i don't know if that's the word she used and that she implicitly said it's when we get back around the same types of toxic people but we don't always know that's happening um well yeah wheels you're dealing with um i'm so sorry to hear that you're feeling horribly guilty because that's the codependency that's yeah that's what you've been um through no fault of your own taken on since the very beginning of your life no doubt and um I, I, yeah, all I can, I, I can say about that really is I hope you can keep working through, you know, that codependent aspect of feeling bad for your father because he's making his own choices and you're in that false responsibility zone. You're not responsible for your father's choices. And, um, so hopefully you can start to feel what you're feeling about that without that horrible guilt, because again it's toxic guilt it kind of goes back to really it's it's just akin to programming that happens in childhood and when we're little kids we don't have any defense against it number one and number two we don't know there's anything wrong with it uh gemini girl i find myself to be easily manipulated I never want to be the one to hurt others, but feeling toxic guilt for cutting my BPDX out of my life, he doesn't understand how I just, how I can just end everything. Well, see, and, and yeah, that's interesting because <clears throat> I would say to you with compassion and respect, why does it matter that he doesn't understand? See, there's all these little wiggly hooks in there, right? It's like, and they're difficult to navigate. And if you still find yourself being easily manipulated, then, um, you know, I wonder if you look back in your childhood, you know, where, where do you think that comes from? Why do you think that is? <clears throat> you don't have to answer me. I'm just saying those are questions for you to think about. Um, and that toxic guilt that you're feeling. Yeah. People have to realize it's, it's so not, it goes back to something you felt in childhood. It's like way huger than these adult relationships. And, you know, if he doesn't understand how you can just end everything, well, again, don't get in the false responsibility narrative. It's not your responsibility what he understands or doesn't understand. It's just your responsibility to take care of you. And Nancy, he idealized, devalued, and discarded me in, in um, just within a couple of hours last Friday because I wouldn't leave my current partner for him. He'd been begging me to marry him. Yeah, those are all red flags, aren't they? Like everything in a hurry and everything right away and kind of like all his way without regard to anything that you felt or, you know, that could be conflictual for you or that you didn't feel or that you weren't going to do. 
like boundaries, right? You had no respect for anything that was a boundary of yours. And Gemini Girl, I've gotten my power back. He still finds ways to contact me. But each time I hear from him, I go backwards a few steps. He really gets in my head. Well, and is there a way to keep eliminating the new ways that he finds to contact you? Because that's the importance of no, and I know sometimes they're almost impossible. But that's the importance of no contact because it's not only about healing and moving forward, but it's it's momentum too, you know, momentum in healing and starting to feel better about oneself, etc. And then you hear from them and it does, you know, throw people back. Like in the beginning, control them all the way back. After a certain amount of healing, it, like you said, you know, put you backwards a few steps. So however he's still contacting you, you need to find a way to end that. And the number one way to end that is to simply report to the police and say that, you know, this person is, it's unwanted contact and, and, and document it. And, you know, anybody that can't quit it, no matter how hard you make it for them to contact you, or if they show up like when you're on the street or if they show up to where you live, that's when it's time to get the police involved. And that's somebody who, you know, is, is really, really out of control, beyond the average out of control of people with BPD. Because not everybody with BPD will do that. But um, so I'm sure that, you know, it's not like maybe you haven't tried to be full no contact. And, and then he, you said he still keeps finding these ways to contact you. Well, you have to find a way to dry up those avenues of contact, whatever they might be. Because um, it's not a good sign what he's doing, and you certainly don't need it. And sometimes people really do have to um, get the police involved, etc., get restraining orders and that type of thing, because it it they won't stop if, uh, you know, for any other reason. They just don't know how to stop. And Sarah said, when the person with BPD gets married, is that usually in the idealization and honeymoon phase? Well, yeah, when they get married, because, oh, my God, that's that's got to bring on fear of engulfment for sure. Um, but, but yeah, it's they're still in the idealization phase. And then if, if that stays like that uh, for a little while or varying periods of time, depending on the person with BPD, then it can be a honeymoon phase. But I've had many clients tell me, too, that there was really no honeymoon phase. As soon as they got married or as soon as they moved in or whatever the case may be, it just all went kind of to hell in a handbasket right then, even though they didn't know what was happening. And Nancy, I didn't get my work done at all because, this, because of this guy. It was beyond crazy. Fortunately, my partner forgave me for what happened. Well, yeah, and, and just know, Nancy, like, I mean this with all due respect, right? But um, if you weren't getting your work done because of the guy, it was also because of the choice that you made that, you know, how you ended up involved with the guy. So, you know, don't don't want people to hang on to false responsibility, but it is important to look at your part in, you know, what you sort of got involved with there. And, and yeah. I mean, you didn't know what was happening, and I don't want to sound like I'm judging, but there's there's a dualistic uh, reality there. And it's important to make sure that you take care of your own house, right, and what happened from your perspective, plus all that they did, right? And Sarah, I haven't seen my ex in three years, and he texted me something about marrying me. I thought it was crazy. Um, that he's thinking about it. He won't see me, but wanted to marry me. Makes no sense. Well, right. And so why do you think you keep engaging? Why are you not full no contact yet? Because um, what part of you in your unconscious mind needs to keep repeating, you know, the, the cycle of he texts you with something and, of course, it's never going to be less crazy or less nonsensical. Um, so that's that's the whole thing about um, taking care of oneself. 
and getting fully out of the situation and fully out of the contact because it doesn't make sense. And do you really think you want to spend your time on trying to make sense out of it or not? Or trying to figure out why it doesn't make sense? Makes sense in, in terms of understanding somebody with BPD, but it's outlandishly ridiculous <laughs> otherwise. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, interesting that I don't know when I, when I bring up these topics, but, um, I don't know what people think about, or if you will think about the false self, self false self aspect of how codependency develops, has developed in, in your lives or, you know, ha, you know, in people with codependency, where it comes from, what it means and the toxic shame and guilt can be the biggest block of all creating a toxic freeze or pawn response in codependency that really is blocking people from getting to no contact. Cause the other side of that shame and guilt and taking too much responsibility that isn't yours for anyone doing that is um, the flip side of it is still self abandonment, still self sacrifice, um, still opening oneself up to, to something that indicates maybe something from childhood still needs to be looked at a little more deeply. Yeah, I remember that, Sarah. He said, I never reach out first. I'm still dealing with residual codependency. I feel bad for him. Yeah, why? I guess, but do realize it's not my problem anymore. But yeah, but yet you still feel bad for him. So I wonder, who does he remind you of, mother or father? What, what, what is the sticking point? And I mean, with all due respect, this goes back to something deeper. Because it doesn't sound to me like for you it's really about him. Um, Nancy, I've never gotten validation, specifically words of affirmation and physical touch, from a male, namely my dad, in my life. So love bombing is words of affirmation and physical touch on steroids. Yes, I, I totally understand that. Um, and prior to the current partner, I had terrible experiences in romantic relationships. Yes, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I've been also having a, a career difficulties for a long time. Not being able to get a satisfying full-time job or run a full-time business. Losing my steady part-time job last week. Well, sorry to hear that too. And getting scammed by my ex-employer last month. Maybe these, those things have made me vulnerable and susceptible. Well, yes. And, um, I mean, there's a lot going on in the world that, you know, and people can't control everything for sure. But, um, yeah, I mean, then you said you got scammed by the ex-employer. I'm so sorry to hear that. But again, I guess if there's remnants of codependency, then toxic people or whatever your ex-employer is about, but toxic people will sense that and take advantage of that. And, and that doesn't make it your fault, but I'm just saying, you know, I think it's, this is why it's so crucial for people to be really self-aware. And, and I'm not saying you're not Nancy. And the fact that you're aware that, you know, it kind of goes back to your father that, you know, he never, um, he never got validation. Yes. Well, and maybe there's, maybe there's still some reparative work to do around that, you know, to, to give that validation to your wounded inner child or still somewhat in a wounded inner child, um, that would probably help you. Uh, hey there, Joe. Hi, AJ. Still following, still trying to get to no contact, still not quite learning, slowly getting less reluctant to go no contact, too much blame thrown my way after something that starts out, um, well, I don't know if that's easy or uh, I'm not sure what that means, but um, and just remember, you know, no contact is, is very painful, very difficult because when people go no contact, it, it will put you fully more in, well, maybe not right away, but it, the goal is to look at self, 
right? Look at the codependency, look at your own healing and recovery. And that means the difference between not being full no contact and being full no contact is that you can't really get on with your own healing and you're not really, don't mean just you, people often aren't then facing the pain that they need to heal. And like I've said before, it's never going to, it's not going to be like you're going to wake up one morning and go, this is the day I'm ready, this is perfect. You know, it's very difficult. So um, sometimes, you know, like people just have to kind of do it. And what I, what I notice with clients is, you know, and, and there's lots of fear around doing it. There's lots of, you know, different moving pieces of pain and difficulty and still feeling sorry for them, et cetera, et cetera. But slamming that door shut and saying no in that way and going no contact is what opens up so much more of the healing and recovery journey. But yeah, it, it does involve getting in touch with people's own pain. That's not easy. Sarah said, it's the cognitive dissonance. It reminds me of my mom. The dynamic with him in the, is the same as with my mom. Well, and I think, Sarah, that that's where you have to look to heal some more of the dynamic with your mother because I don't think it's really about this guy anymore except for that connection you just made, you know, which is um, more than just a reminder, by the way. The dynamic is the same, so there's still something left over and you know somewhat of a wounded inner child inside of you and you need to work on that to free yourself of of the whole dynamic whether it's it's more sort of put out onto the x um but as you know it kind of originated with your mom rob hi aj i felt a lot of toxic guilt hit me this past weekend I am no contact, and her birthday was in June. Also, her sister contacted me, but I didn't open the email. Still feel like I want wanted to um, talk to her, but stopped myself. I even felt guilty for not wishing her, um, but I stayed strong. I think you mean wishing her a happy birthday. Well, yeah, and I mean, I think what's important for people is to really dig down and ask the question and journal about it at the very least. If you're not working with somebody is, why are you feeling this guilt? And where does it go back to in your childhood? Because after they've, it, 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 it's like the Stockholm Syndrome of it all, isn't it? Really, when, when you're still identifying with, caring about, feeling sorry for, feeling guilty about an abuser, right? So complicated stuff for sure. Uh, Dana, thanks. Um, Thanks you. I learned so much about BPD thanks to your videos. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, I'm not sure if that's Marcin or Markin. Um, what's your opinion about telling the closet family, closest, sorry, family, in this case sister, of my ex fiance that my ex has BPD and she'll get treatment? Um, ex is already married and pregnant. I felt... I feel that I shall help in that way. Opinion about telling the closest family. I would say don't do it, you know, because it's you holding on to false responsibility again. It's not your responsibility. Can't save, can't rescue, can't fix anybody. Um, and, and, you know, hey, it's on your mind and you care and you're still somewhat involved with that. I, I get that out of your comment, but... These are the, the choices that people have to make to continue in their own healing and recovery journey so that, you know, you, you think that you can help in that way, but, but you probably won't, like, you know, probably won't help. And the other thing is, you know, this isn't your responsibility. So I, you know, I don't know, but, but that's my opinion is that you would be better off to just leave it alone Keep focusing on yourself and your life and, and keep moving forward. Wheels, I definitely think shame has a huge impact on how I view my dad. On some level, I don't I don't feel like I deserve more than the crumbs of decency I get sometimes. I also feel bad because dad gets psycho wrath. Yeah, but he married her. He married her and he stays with her. That's his problem. That's his responsibility. So, you know, and let's face it, when he's getting a rap, you don't get it. So, you know, it's, it's I hear you wheels and it's, it's that codependency, right? It's the way that you're, 
mind was programmed by these people that somehow everything was going to be your fault because they decided so. And keep remembering that your father has not rescued you. Your your father, as a child even, your father did not do anything about all of this. So if he's getting the wrath of Psycho, so what? I mean, easier for me to say, but that's where you, you got to think about aiming toward. Because he, none of that's your responsibility. He's made his bed. He's laying in it. That's his choice. Uh, CB, my ex stands for my emotionally unavailable father and my victim mother who always felt abandoned. So I'm now associating both with my ex, trying to emotionally connect and feel guilty for leaving. Well, see, and that's where really getting into this healing recovery journey I'm always talking about that I work with lots of clients on um, is so important because you have to go back to the origin of that with your mother and father to heal that in a wound in your wounded inner child or it's not going to change with the ex um Leo sometimes too I don't know if this even makes sense I think it's also the fact that I just want someone to care about me well yes and that's and and I think that might that's in there for sure but then there's also that other moving piece of this journey you're on wheels, which is very painful, which is um, you're, you're not going to get one of them to care about you because it's the family system, it's the way they operate, and it's unfortunately who they are. You deserve it, but you're not going to get it. And that's really tough to have to go through um, understanding and, and processing. Uh, see, the understanding all this makes it so much easier. He could have taken steps for his own recovery years ago. Not my problem anymore. Right. But where it connects to um, your father and your mother, it is still your problem very much. You see, it's not really that the ex is the problem. It's what's down deeper in your wounded inner child from your parents. Um well, I'm glad something was interesting there, Joe. I don't know what you're referring to, but that's cool. And, um, yeah, I just think people need to know that, you know, codependency is the abandonment of self, and it's learned. It's not like you just decided to abandon yourself. Um, but continual abandonment of self and the feelings of toxic shame and toxic guilt to go back to childhood. And then there's the false self involved. And so... You're not getting to know who you authentically are. You're not getting to build your self-esteem and your self-worth. People need to, and it's a process, but people need to work on the inner child healing, family of origin work, and self-differentiation. I just happen to mention those three aspects because that's what I do with so many clients. And until unless people do that with somebody in some fashion or other, you're going to keep having these difficulties that truly are being, in a way, projected out with people with codependency onto the ex of BPD or the narc or the whomever because it's not really about them. It's about the repetition compulsion within codependency from how you were wounded as a child. That's where people have to go back to the work. So when I work with clients, it's often that, yes, they're, talking about the borderline or the narcissist or the parent and the ex and whatever. And they have to work on that as well. But then it's getting into the deeper process of healing the wounded inner child and what really happened in family of origin, what really happened with the parent or parents. And until unless people are willing to do that work, you're going to remain in an element of the false self within codependency. You're not going to get to your authentic self and you've lost yourself more then, then you were lost in childhood to again being with a cluster B and replicating the repetition compulsions of the codependent unhealthy relational style that nobody chooses. It happens in childhood. So again, there's a lot of responsibility for people with codependency to learn to take and to stop taking everything that isn't, you know, stop taking on everything that isn't your personal responsibility. But so many people with codependency keep on, you know, Put it out to the ex, you know, with BPD or the narcissist or 
even still blaming parents when really now the journey is yours to take to do the kind of healing and the deeper work that will set you free. And uh, CP said, I'm so angry about wasting so much emotional energy on a daily basis due to PTSD. Well, it's it's not only due to PTSD. It's it's due to what, you know, I'm talking about here as well. And it's like um, being angry about it makes sense because anger is a protective emotion because underneath anger is pain and grief. He said, I wish I could direct this energy on all the good things I could achieve. Well, if you do that inner child healing work, you'll be able to. Um, Joe, I wonder if my ex felt any less triggered by leaving me and going back to live with her original BPD. Her mom, I mean. I mean like the abusive environment not being a threatening um, real reciprocity. Oh, wait a minute. I think I have to read that again. Um, CB, I just want to say to you, I hear you when you say I keep trying, but you need to send an in set an intention. Set goals behind the intention. Write it down. Find someone to work with if you're not working with someone already. And if you're working with somebody and it ain't working, find somebody else that's going to help you and, and help you to get there. But you have to have the intent to do it. And it's painful work, but it's rewarding work. You have to go through the pain and the grief to let it go from childhood. To self-differentiate and get out of family of origin roles and all of that, um, you know, stuff. But I have a better way to put it. So what you said there, Joe. Um, uh, hmm. Oh, I see now on rereading your comments. So you think that the abusive environment was not as threatening as real reciprocity. Well, I think the abusive environment has within it inherent threats, triggers, open wounds, etc. But, um, and I don't think a person with BPD, like who you're describing, probably not having had any or much therapy, would be aware of making any kind of choice between um, going back to an abusive environment uh, versus trying to deal with being reciprocal. Because it's not even on their radar, reciprocity, until unless they are significantly treated. And then you said, I meant that leaving and going back to her mother that has B BPD may be less threatening than living with me. Well, I think there would be, I don't think it's less threatening. I think it's two different kinds of threats. And I think it's really her repetition compulsion for what she's most used to, tragically enough, because going back to, you know, the mother that wounded her is not going to help her to be, it's, it's going backwards instead of forwards but I think they were both um yeah I can see where it was maybe more threatening to try to um live with you etc but you see without treatment like you know she's still very much in that um child victim mindset and she's going back to what she's used to because it's an uncomfortable comfort zone and Rab said, I find that I'm battling with myself, saying I have to heal myself now, but then it goes back to why things went down the way it did with my ex. The mind games and then anger hits me. Well, it sounds, Rab, like that's, you know, you're resisting. You're resisting going where you need to go, which is understandable in the sense that it will be painful. And then you said, um... Because you said when you, you know you need to heal yourself or maybe get some help with that work. Um, yeah, then the anger hits you because anger, again, is protecting against the pain. Sounds like the pain is pushing up some more and that you kind of go around a little cycle with it. And then you get angry um, by, by sort of involving the ex again when, when they're not really, she's not really the issue anymore. Um, but then you get angry again, and then that keeps you out of the work of going to the pain um, that goes back to your childhood. And people do this, you know, not, not so consciously, but people do it. Um, we also said, yeah, it sucks to hear all this, but you ain't wrong. 
he would have figured it out and left but i wonder if he knows i'm the scapegoat oh yes he bloody knows that see when you're getting scapegoated he's not getting it when he's getting it you're not getting it and wants to keep me stuck to keep most of the heat up yeah exactly he wants if he, you are he knows you're the scapegoat and he knows that when you're getting it he doesn't get it and so how selfish is that and how highly immature is that uh you know someone who was supposed to protect you and take care of you um it's more than just immature it's your father if if he he has codependency and nothing else then then you know he's totally living from that false self for sure um joe thank you for your words i'm going to book another session this week so we can talk further okay great well i wasn't going to say anything about that joe but you did but i look forward to talking to you again um wheels i know how quick my bros will throw me under the bus to stay on psycho's good side and protect themselves um why wouldn't dad um why wouldn't he protect himself by throwing you under the bus are you sure like i think i think he's already done that many times um so yeah i mean i'm not sure when you say why wouldn't dad if you're asking in a sense of just trying to um hope that he wouldn't be the same but i i don't think he's very much different from your siblings in that regard and let's face it i mean you know like with my dark chad father for example um you know when that guy roared like <laughs> i guess you know the golden child definitely he never roared at my mother it's so bizarre but i was the one who was going to get it although sometimes a neighbor got it sometimes a relative got it too but the whole thing was that people would chip over themselves often when there was relatives around and stuff and he was about to lose it and roar and all this kind of abusive stuff um and everybody would just you know like they'd forget that we had any relationship or they'd forget that i was they knew i was his bloody scapegoat too and all they did was side with him and kind of like they didn't all stand up and hide behind him physically but they may as well have because they, uh, people want to bail out of that line of fire and they'll and <laughs> they'll leave you standing there by yourself every single time that was my experience and cb said that's the thing all these patterns are repetitive yes they definitely are and they're repetitive on an unconscious level and then people get to varying degrees conscious like you know you have some insight there and some awareness but it it you know i don't want to make it sound like this journey to heal from codependency and to heal from whatever you know wounded your inner child it's not easy but it is so it is so the way that you can free yourself and it is so rewarding a journey and you said i'm proud of myself that i managed to break through the gaslighting and reclaim my truth and stand up for myself well yeah and now you just need to set the intent write it down with the goals find somebody to work with and start taking the next step in your journey and then that'll be something else to celebrate as well because it's like one step at a time right wheels yeah that's what i'm saying he definitely has thrown me into the bus for himself it makes sense that my dad would since my bros and other relatives do too or do yeah well and i was just sharing with you wheels like that would happen to me too like you know when i was a kid if we were at my grandmother's or another relative and there might have been several aunts and uncles and cousins and like yeah, because i come from a big family of origin like i mean extended family and whenever you know either my mother well my mother tended to be more covert so she didn't do it in front of other people but when my father was going to lose it and i mean and i was going to be the target but people were just literally i mean they weren't physically but they would dive out of the way i mean you know and and, and i'm not saying physically but i always knew you know i mean i guess at a certain point when i was younger i didn't but like i didn't know what was going on but then as i started to get you know 12 13 i kind of always knew it didn't matter what was going on somebody else could piss him off somebody else set his you know 
wounded wounded tremendous like little teeny weeny ego off and he was going to come and find me and i was going to be responsible for it in his mind um joe to cb how did you deal with the gaslighting and cb said my ex refused intimacy out of fear of rejection and gaslighted me trying to make me believe that i was embarrassing and that your wishes were unreasonable i called him out on it um one just can't live like this yes well that that's good that you were able to you know work your way through that see that gain that insight and stand up for yourself so now it's like you got to stand up for yourself a little bit more in a different kind of way and he said yes exactly i'm waiting for a therapy place oh good looking forward to this so much well that's that's excellent really important that people do take that journey because without it the repetition compulsions of bpd or i guess narcissists have them too is you know different things and then the repetition compulsions of people with codependency are going to keep playing out unless and until they get healed as well so it's it's really weird cuz you know codependency is not really um you know thank goodness it's got nothing to do with american pseudoscience of psychiatry and their stupid book the dsm but um it's it's sort of out there flopping around people interpreting it differently and you know so and i won't i won't get onto the subject much except to say from watching this crazy channel of super warrior empaths and and really you know it's it's rampant codependency but hey they have to do what they have to do um sarah at what point does the person with bpd become aware of the repetition compulsion well for some of them never you know i mean um it 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 takes quite a bit in treatment to become aware of that so uh you said is it something they only recognize in therapy pretty much yes i don't think people would really get a lot of window of insight into repetition compulsions without therapy and so at what point do they well some of them never do um same could be said for some people with codependency though we're not talking about the exact same repetition compulsions and wheels your story just made me remember how much relatives friends and others dove out of the way and threw me under the bus um the way your dad behaved with the occasional relative or, or outsider getting it yes well but they wouldn't get i'd still get it after they got it right because nothing was ever satiating of that dude um cb how to break through the gaslighting never lose sight completely of the objective reality how are how are people dealing with things etc and then compare also cultivate your own inner voice well yes which has a lot to do with you know working on healing the uh invoked narrative of you know the inner critic trusting instincts can help to a degree for sure uh nancy the bpd guy I dealt with is aware that he has bpd he didn't want me to feel responsible for him but he unconsciously ended up making me responsible anyway well and why would like how do you know he didn't want you to feel responsible because what he said that like that would matter um yeah it the people with bpd and, and and i don't know if he's had any treatment or not but obviously not enough they're always going to unconsciously end up making others feel responsible anyway or you know people with still a little bit of codependency or codependency reenlivened by the situation going to take on that false load of responsibility again because even though people with bpd you know project that out and blame and thrust that on other people uh people need to not accept that right and you said he's been working on resolving his cptsd and is also in therapy well he isn't getting far enough but he hasn't addressed his bpd well that's interesting i was going to suggest resources for him but he had already discarded me before i got the chance well do you think that, that was like kind of like a measure of where your codependency was in that situation 
Dana, did you already have did you already have psychosis when you were still suffering of BPD? No, I never had any psychosis whatsoever. But then you have to remember, I was never assessed for BPD. I was just labeled with it. Don't think I ever fit the diagnosis exactly. But yeah, I had a lot of trauma to heal and recover from, family of origin. But uh, no, and not everybody with BPD has psychosis. And I never had a psychotic second. Um, never wanted to commit suicide. I was very atypical for BPD, especially uh, what it is today because it's morphed and uh, the pathologizing of it is just never going to end. But uh, it's funny when you said, did you already have psychosis? <laughs> no, when I had BPD, no, I never did. Um, Joe, well, my, instinct, uh, w my instincts told me for two or three years that my ex would get better and that our love was actually real. And it was very difficult to come to the conclusion that it wasn't. Well, and sometimes with other things going on, right, instincts aren't as, as trustable as when there isn't so much emotion going on and so much desire for something to come about in a way that one hopes for it can kind of skew the um, instinct somewhat at times. Um, CBAJ, do you know anything about how to manage CPTSD symptoms like physically overheating? I sometimes need to change my clothes because I'm sweating so much. Um, just don't know how to manage. Well, it sounds like it's um, definitely like a, it, it could be a somatic flashback that's driving that. So again, you'd want to be working on, um, you know, as much healing and recovery as you can. You want to be working on what's triggering that um, and, and, and that kind of thing. Because, um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're dealing with it the best you can when it happens. But the best way to manage it would be to look for the, you know, and again, you could probably do this more in therapy, but um, look for where the triggers are, are coming from and what, what is the cause because otherwise you're just going to be dealing with the symptoms. Nancy, he discarded me after I finally set a few realistic boundaries with him. He perceived my action as abandonment rejection. Well, yeah, and that shouldn't be a surprise though, really, right? Because even though the dude's in therapy, it doesn't sound like the dude's getting anywhere, really. Um, wheels, yeah, same here, AJ. Even when the outsiders get it, they get a pretty mild version, and there's always an aftermath of some kind for you. Yes, absolutely. Um, because cause they don't really unleash it on um, relatives or others like they will on the scapegoat. And uh, I remember my father one time really ranting and raving at a neighbor who said something about why wasn't the golden child learning how to drive or something. And what my father's idiot reasons for that were, um, although I, I actually talked him out of getting the golden child a motorcycle when he turned 16, because I'm like, do you want him to be dead or what? Because he's not responsible enough to drive a motorcycle. But anyway, so, so a neighbor, a good, well, quote, friend of theirs, said something about it. And um, my father just started yelling and screaming at him. It was amazing to watch because he just like, tossed him out of the house that didn't used to happen so much uh in that out of control fashion he used to have a better way of doing that with others uh see the trigger for heat seems to be random but i notice it's more when i'm anxious well an anxiety can definitely you know drive different imbalances in in the body etc and so i haven't heard i haven't heard this one before but um making you feel really hot um very possible so then you have to look for what creates the anxiety what triggers the anxiety you said it seems to be random well but maybe when you get your place you know in, in therapy there that you're waiting for you can look more into that because it's highly unlikely that it's random but i can understand it would seem random if you don't know what it goes back to 
Nancy, yes, he told me he hasn't been happy with the therapy he's been receiving. Well, yeah, okay, well, <laughs> then there's a lot of resistance going on there, it sounds like. Um, I don't know, are people supposed to be happy in therapy? I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, CB, I'll see if I can make out triggers. It's kind of constant, immune system, weak, got a kidney infection now. If too much cortisol can do this, then I need to find a way, meditation maybe. Yeah, or progressive relaxation, um, and definitely no contact would help. Um, and it, uh, yes, I mean, I'm sure that you're, you're getting triggered in a way that is releasing too much cortisol, and then these are the symptoms of that, because they're different for everybody. So... Just remember, though, when, when people with BPD or even a narcissist, you know, when they give that protective identification of blame to you, codependents have to deal with the reality of a false self, toxic shame, toxic guilt, taking responsibility that isn't theirs. Well, you know, the fact that you think he meant the quality of the therapy, uh, it's hard to say what's going on there, right? Because is there a problem with the quality of the therapy or is it his problem? I don't know the answer to that. Um, oh, you're welcome, CB. Yeah. So anyway, with that, I think I've um, said about all I had to say. And uh, one of these days, the, the new format, the way I'm trying to do live streams is you know, I would hope for some questions on the topic, you know, would be, would be nice and helpful, helpful, hope, helpful, not to me, but a way that I could be more helpful to others. But, uh, sometimes that's the case and sometimes it's not, and this isn't a simple topic, but I have, I hope people will think about it some more. And, um, Wheels, you said, in some ways I like, uh, when her mask slips in front of others. Usually, but not always, they slip in more subtle ways. It's nice to know she can't always hide crazy. Yeah, but then other people sometimes will shove that under the rug, you know, even though they see something. And uh, CB said, I think my ex is more narc than BPD, actually. I'm journaling to get the toxicity out of my mind. Well, and again, whether he's more narc than BPD doesn't matter now, right? Because again, that's focus that is taken away from the focus that you need to put on yourself for your own healing and recovery. And CB said, you're being so extremely helpful. Thank you for all you're doing. Oh, you're really welcome. So, and with that, I must, um, yeah, get going here. And um, I'm going to think about the next topic for the next live stream. And maybe people could think about if they have any questions about what information I'm sharing. It's it's not easy stuff, though. So maybe that's why that doesn't happen. Um, well, that's an interesting question, Joe. But again, whether her ex has been diagnosed or not is like, again, who cares? <laughs> I mean, people have to refocus. Oh, you're very welcome, Nancy. It was, it was nice to see you again, but I'm sorry it was under the conditions of what you've been through, you know. Um, so, yeah, everybody take care. And I just got to wait for this thing to complete its little cycle. Because I'm sure it's so helpful, you know. Um, yeah, well, all the best to you, Billy the Goat. Um, yeah, everyone take care.